Right, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna get started. Um, so those of you at the back, you either like to sit or escape, either is fine. Um, so apologies for the title. Um, I want to give you an overview, make it clear what we're trying to achieve here. So I want to lay out a possible sort of nominal time frame, well, nominal way that we, as Steve mentioned, we're looking to try and incorporate PI-led science you know, um, as quickly as we can into the CLIPS deliveries. And so I, um, I'm going to discuss um, a way we've been thinking of doing that. Um, I'm basically, I'm going to plow through some slides, um, just sort of informational to get you thinking. Then um, Ryan Stefan out of NASA Glenn, um, he's very kindly put together a few slides, which is already lessons learned to do with the NPLP payloads and working with the Eclipse providers. If there's five slides from him, which I'm going to give, but then I'm going to pause. So if you've got any direct questions, he's on the line and you, um, and you can ask and he can help with the answers. And then I've got a few discussion points, um, which you'll see, which I'm really hoping. The idea, this is meant to be two-way information. I'm going to put forward what we might do, and then I want you to say where that doesn't work or where it could work better. Okay, so um, just to re recap very briefly, in case you, um, you weren't here for Steve's talk, um, you know, one of our roles is instruments to fly on clips. We did two instrument calls, an internal one, which is NPLP, and the external one, which is LSITP, they were very similar. They both, they both weren't your, sort of your typical call for instruments. In, in fact, that schedule was a key driver. You had to propose things that were near ready for flight. Um, with NPLP, uh, so future calls, I'm going to just talk about, they'll be, first of all, the key um, part is they're going to be both internal and external. The, we only did the internal call uh, it, that also was schedule driven, just financially it's easier to do the money in house and we didn't want to delay the first clips task order and potential for delivery waiting for instruments. So that's the only reason that we did the two separate calls. Going forward you would expect to have a call of approximately once per year and for it to be both internal and external to NASA combined. And as I just said, the goal is to head towards a PI led science suite um, instruments as quickly as, as we can make it work. And also, many of, our, um, many of the international space agencies have reached out to us about how they might be able and are interested in providing instruments that could fly with Eclipse provider. And so folding that into how we do that, combine that with PI suites is something to discuss as well. So if you didn't see, um, with, the, with the NASA um, provided lunar payloads, 13 were selected back in February of this year. I won't go, um, I won't go through them. Uh, oh, it is weird. Okay. I won't go, th won't go through them all because I can't get the pointer to work. Um, so, but it, the, the key here is there was, a, so there was a mixture of what you'd think of as classical science instruments, those that are technology demonstrations, and those that are providing um, key data sets to help with on, on the human side. Oh, just. Ah, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so then we have the very recently announced um, LSIP P payloads. There were 12 of those. Um, I'll leave them up briefly. You can read. And again, there was a mixture here between, again, science payloads. Um, what you might call there's a there's a there's a, there's a planet vac. So there's some, there's two which actually involve sample acquisition. There's a small rover. Um, there's, there's rad hardened computing, um, and then the rest are sort of our, our, our science payloads. So, you know, the goal going forward here, as Steve mentioned, the plan is to have two deliveries to the lunar surface every calendar year, more or less. Um, this will involve both polar and non-polar missions. Um, and we're also reaching out to the CLIPS providers to see what their capabilities are regarding delivering CubeSats or small sats into various scales of lunar orbit as part of a delivery. So we're not forgetting that there are also key orbital data sets that it's useful to acquire um, for, for science. Right, so now I've got about four, just a, don't worry, only about four charts. And this is meant to start to get you thinking about what we're going to discuss um, once I 
finish prattling on. Um, and, and many of these points are going to come back when I've got a slide that just says discussion points. But you know, what we're thinking here is initially it probably will be quite modest. And so you can imagine an AO to the science community asking for a relatively small suite, potentially only two or three, um, that can conduct science where you'll be judged as you would be from any other SMD science lunar proposal on the various documents. Um, you might well want to say that you wouldn't be location agnostic. To do your science, you would want to go um, to a particular geologic location. Um, while I say a suite of two to three, we're also aware that we mustn't forget that you might be more of a loner. You don't need any friends. And in fact, your instrument is self-sufficient. Um, you do want to send it to a particular place to do your science, but you don't need to be part of a suite. So as we talk about a PI suite, be aware that I'm not trying to rule out that you have to find a friend in order to do this. So, um, you know, so an example could be someone proposing three instruments. They might provide a list of lunar swirls, um, and that would be their proposal. We need to think about how do we handle mobility? How do we, how do we, what if your instrument needs to access lunar material either on the surface or subsurface? As a community, is it better for you to, um, for us to somehow work out how mobility and, and surface access or subsurface access is offered as a resource? So you propose your instruments and you say, but whoever you fly it on, we're going to have to be able to get access to the material. Um, going forward, we need to think about how one might incorporate the LCP instruments and potentially MPLP rebuilds and international contributions into any suite that you propose. Um, a key one that we're, we're thinking of is how much time is needed from selection to instrument delivery. And this is one number we can discuss. We're going to throw out a scenario where we're considering mm -hmm from selection, you would have 22 months in order to deliver your payload to whichever CLIPS provider had been chosen. So when we get to the discussion um, period, one of the things I'm going to come back to, you know, is what I'm going to keep repeating is what don't we get from, you, from, from, from the science community with some of these constraints that we might choose to put on you? And, and that 22 months is obviously a flexible number, um, and if it needs to be longer, or we, or we risk losing a certain type of payload or multiple types of payload, then that's why we're having this initial discussion. Um, so what resources are needed to obtain these suites of instruments? You know, hypothetically, if we said approximately $30 million, including integration and test and ops, and 30 kilograms, would we get good proposals? Again, I'm going to come back to this when we have the discussion period. And again, key, what wouldn't we get if that's the scale of what we think we can ask for. It's important to realize that when you propose, you are proposing independent of which CLIPS um, provider gets selected to take you. And I've got a slide later on that will sort of discuss what the nominal um, process is. That were related to the fact that you are proposing without knowing um, which provider you are flying on, there is currently no standardization for interfaces. And I'm going to be talking about what part of that gives you the most heartburn. And if we had, another way of phrasing that is, if we were to, for want of a better word, inflict a standardized interface on the CLIPS providers, which one would, is, is, is it clearly most beneficial for that to be? Uh, examples could be thermal design. Um, do you want to know that you are independent or do you want to know that you can go through the lander? Um, things like a central solid-state data recorder. Different providers have a different model for that. Some have it, some don't. Um, I mentioned we need to continue a call for instruments in addition to asking for suites. Um, another one is how important is it to have a survive-the-night capability to do your science? Um, and that could be one of two things. It could be the fact that certain providers may grow into the capability where they survive the night. Um, another part is you could have an ALSEP-like capability that, if you like, is a NASA-provided resource that you would plug into. But we need to start to get feedback about, is there science which is drastically better if it's taken over longer than 14 days? And or is there science that you're just not going to propose if you know that your instrument is only going to work um, for one lunar day? And finally, uh, the last thing we're gonna, we're at the end, 
Initially, we'd thought about actually doing a full day workshop um, on this topic on Friday, but we thought about it, and given the fact that a lot of us were very busy last weekend with the Apollo 11 stuff and then all this week, we were really worried that people, in the nicest possible way, just weren't gonna, wasn't the right time to add another day to everyone. It doesn't mean that depending on the discussion and, and how much extra feedback the community feels they need to give to us before we consider doing an AO for PI instruments, it's feasible that we could, you know, we can certainly plan a full day workshop and we can plan one either with or without the CLIPS providers themselves or one of each or whatever. Again, we can come back to that in the discussion period. So here's a nominal um, PI-led CLIPS timeline. So again, the goal is to, to transition um, with, uh, uh, in some future task order. If we did two missions per year, one scenario is you know, one polar and one non-polar. There's a lot of obviously science associated with not polar. We do have, um, you know, part of what we do is to support the human exploration side, plus the poles are interesting scientifically. Um, we're assuming, based on the data points that we currently have, that it will likely be about 26 months from task order selection for the provider to flight. That, as, that might change, but um, two of the three providers um, that we just got selected, that's what they're doing. So let's assume we do ask the community to propose a suite of instruments to a specific geologic location. What would happen is we would do an AO um, and the, maybe the, the timeline down here at the bottom. One question to cover with the discussion period is, do you need a draft AO? You know, is, if you get enough warning, is that just unnecessarily wasted time? Or are we gonna get much better proposals because we do do a draft AO and you get the chance to say where we're getting it wrong in the AO and we have time to fix it? The numbers here are the sort of number of, not, of time in months between each of these sort of milestone. Then we would have an instrument AO, so that's the call to you for a suite of instruments. I've written three question mark, you know, how long do you need for the proposals? We'd obviously like to shorten this as much as possible, but we don't want to shorten it to the point where we're hurting ourselves and, and you. Then, you know, there'll be typical, you know, up to six months from proposals due to the selection of the suite. And then what would happen is, the suite or suites that we picked would feed into a task order to the CLIPS providers. Um, and at that point, we could, we could supplement your suites with other instruments, other instruments that are standalone or in international instruments or um, instruments from other mission directorates. Uh, then you would have task order selection uh, and then delivery of your instruments approximately 17 months after that. We're assuming instrument delivery roughly nine months before launch. Um, given the fact that you would start work on your instruments on selection, there's a little bit of extra time between your selection and the task order selection, so you can see um, that we think that you have roughly, it's roughly um, 20, 22 months for delivery. The other thing is, how to incorporate, if at all, LSITP, NPLP rebuilds, and international payloads uh, into what you propose. There's a couple of different scenarios here. There's a scenario where, if you like, we have a menu of instruments, and these, these instruments essentially already exist. And that would be LSITP, and they would normally, if you like, be free because they've been paid for, if you think of it as a menu. You've got NPLP rebuilds with a cost, and you have any international contributions which would also be free. So one scenario is when you propose a suite, you could choose in addition to any instruments that you would be wanting to propose that you would, have, you would be building as part of this, you could call upon that menu. Now that, we're not sure that is the right way to do this because there are complications. The LCP payloads, they were proposed by individuals with a science goal in mind how well is it, that, is it fair to then force them to be part of a, of a bigger group? The other option would be that when you propose your suite, it's purely new instruments that you can build if funded in roughly 22 months, but you can refer to the menu and you can say, well, if you, you know, we'd like you to fly our three instruments, this is what we want it to do, but we think this LCP and this NPLP rebuild and this international instrument, any of those would enhance the science that we propose to do, and here's why. 
So those are two different ways of handling the fact we do have other instruments. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to pull this up um, if we have questions during the discussion period um, too. So um, Ryan, I mentioned um, that Ryan Stefan, who um, fortunately isn't able to make it here today, but he's on the line. He works for PESTO, the Planetary Exploration Science Technology Office um, at NASA Glenn, and he's played a key role um, with us, with NPLP and LCP, and he's monitoring all the NPLP payloads now. And I, we asked him to put together some, uh, even though it's fairly recent, you know, any key lessons learned from interactions with the NPLP payloads um, and the CLIPS providers that they've been chosen to fly with. So just a quick sound check. Ryan, can you, can, can you hear? Can, well, you can, can yeah, Ben, I can hear you well. Thank and you. you can speak. Excellent. Right. So I'm now going to go through Ryan's slides. Um, and Ryan, do, if I, when I get them wrong, step in. Otherwise, assuming there are some questions to these, you can help with the answering. So a payload accommodation considerations. Um, when you propose... The, you know, you'll propose a certain you know, design, and this design will naturally change um, once, you once you know who you're flying with and you have discussions with your CLIPS provider. So you need to think about trying to get a handle on how much is your mass likely to change, because there will typically be a cost associated with that change. There's also what exactly is included in your payload mass. Are you making sure that you're including everything needed um, to wiring, harnesses, etc. Um, that might not be provided by the, by the CLIPS delivery surface, or whether you need MLI for thermal on your, uh, on, on your instrument. Um, establishing interface boundaries. Now, I asked, we asked Ryan to do this from a lessons learned. Some, I've, I've included everything that he sent. Some of these, at some level, you might argue are lessons learned to us, in that when we write the task order next time, we will, we, we will do it probably in a better way to get rid of some of these ambiguities that have occurred. You know, one is who is establishing the interface boundary. And if you need a mounting bracket, who's providing that bracket? Is it, is, it, is it NASA, which really means is it the PI, and then who pays for that, or is it the, is it the CLIP provider? And all the other interfaces, too. So any payload design uh, modifications have the potential to result in contract modifications and cost increase. For example, if you propose a magnetometer and you say, I have to have this level of cleanliness, um, we, we, we put it out and we don't know the, the level of cleanliness necessarily well enough, we pick a CLIPS provider and then when they, do their mag when they do their analysis, they find out, well, actually, for the magnetometer to get the quality of data that it needs, we actually need a boom to get it far enough away. So it's things like this that we wouldn't necessarily have thought of. Another one is... Do you want to take data en route to the moon? Um, if there's science value in that, we, re we really are going to need to know that um, as part of your proposal. And maybe there'll, there'll be a difference whether it's key, a key part of your science message or whether it's um, a bonus. If, if we can be allowed to operate, this is what extra you would get. Because many of the CLIPS providers, they're really set up when they think about power and um, power budgets, et cetera, for once we're on the lunar surface, this is what we can provide the payload. And, how much, and that isn't necessarily the same amount of power that they can provide during cruise. Um, so payload thermal control. Again, what party is responsible for ensuring that the payload is maintained um, within survival and operational temperature limits? What we've ended up doing with the, um, the, the three pr providers that were selected during the discussions is that there'll be an adiabatic interface. So the instruments are essentially uh, responsible for their own thermal design. They don't feed into heat pipes on the lander to get rid of their heat. They have to have their own radiators and, and their own ability to look after themselves thermally, which, could require, which can require getting power from the providers in order to help with, with that thermal management. The other thing to consider is, is there sufficient power available during the transit? You're probably designing, you, you, you know, you'll be designing your radiators and, and um, thermal system predominantly for when you're on the moon, but you still need, we still need to make sure we understand what you need from a provider during cruise. So here we have um, 
some changes that have all that we've you know we have been readily accommodated. Um, one was the fact that small geometry changes um, in the instruments and their placement um, that has not been an issue. That you know minor changes like that have not been a problem. Um, similarly, Lander provided services. Small changes to power payload power requirements and communication data rates data rates have been easily uh, accommodated. Um, and the third one is concept of operations. You know, the lander partners have agreed to provide NASA with a power communication allocation, and then it's up to the, the, MPMP, the NPLP PIs to develop um, a pay, the, how we operate the instruments, because maybe they can't all operate at the same time, and we're going to have to work out how we operate them such that they all get the data that they need throughout the, over the whole duration of the mission. Yep. Hello. Those interactions, some of those simple interactions won't stay simple, right? Also, as vendors get better at selling their services, and one, you know, the NASA payload, you saw the astrobotic presentation today, you know, they're, they're taking 13 payloads plus, you know, 14 NASA. Well, our, our 14 were pretty simple, and the 13 they're flying are even simpler still. That won't stay that way over time. The vendors are going to fly more complex payloads, we'll fly more complex payloads. The ability to, to handle small changes like geometry and power might not stay that simple. What do you define small? Small changes? Um, so so moving, uh, moving a payload around a, a centimeter this direction rather than that direction, for example, has been easy to accommodate so far. They're not stuffed so much they can't move a little bit. Um, for astrobotic, they're power rich during transit. So if we tell them we need a little more power for thermal management during the transit stage, that hasn't been a problem for them to handle. Um, the bandwidth, all the vendors appear to provide way more bandwidth than these payloads we're asking for transmission for. So at the moment, it's been pretty simple, but I, I just, the warning is, we know we're flying simple payloads now. I don't think we can assume it stays that way. And then um, Ryan's last slide is he's looked at the, um, the nine providers and sort of made a, a, a suggestion that if you, if you had to, you know, given the fact there aren't standards, were you, to, were you to design to these um, interfaces or allocations, you would increase your chance, you would reduce the likelihood for problems independent of which of the CLIPS providers um, you were chosen to fly on. Um, so I'll let you, I won't read through those. I'll, let, I'll, leave, but I'll leave this one up and then ask if the... Yeah, let me add to that one yep. too. So, so first and foremost, if you have payloads that need more than this, that's fine. We just need to know it up front. Um, the larger it is, the more power it takes, the more anything it takes, the more complex it is to integrate it with other payloads. Um, but we're happy to fly any payload that makes sense to fly. If you follow these kinds of framework that Ryan gave us here, the odds of your being able to go on multiple landers or multiple vendors' landers and mixing with other payload go up. That's probably the right way to talk about what we're seeing here. So. Um, are there any questions on the lessons learned those last five slides that anyone would have um, for for Ryan? If you, you you either have to stand up or have something soft thrown at you. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. Uh, so as these landers become more full, um, obviously the opportunity to reject heat on an individual payload goes down. Uh, so is the adiabatic assumption go away in the future when there's more payloads on there? Ryan, Ryan, what do you think from what your interactions with him so far? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I don't think, I, I, you know, based on some of the payload users guides and the way that those things are written, um, I think the standard service for the majority of the uh, uh, lander partners is going to be that each payload will be treated adiabatic. Um, I know that there, in some in some cases, there are opportunities to deal with thermal control differently, but I know that that would be considered a non-standard service um, and would come with you know integration complexity and potentially a cost increase.
Hey, Ryan, Chris Zuckney here. Um, how do you deal if you have two or three instruments next to each other, each of them uh, potentially pumps out heat? How do you account for that? Uh, because one, you know, one option is each lander will tell you what's a thermal environment en route to, to the moon and on the surface of the moon, but if you, if you have another one or two instruments sitting next to each other and each of them has to dissipate some, some amount of heat, how, uh, how are you going to deal with that? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the, way, the way we've been handling thermal control, it's a model that I've largely kind of stolen from the International Space Station. Um, uh, you know, when you're developing an instrument or, or an EVA, pay, an external uh, payload for the International Space Station, you know, it's not practical for somebody who's uh, working a small project to run an integrated thermal model the entire space station to capture all that, you know, direct and reflected solar uh, and the associated infrared thermal load from nearby things. So what, what they've done on station is they put um, these flux cubes at different locations, um, and these are just basically thermal black boxes, and then they report to the project the incident infrared load um, from that would include any nearby instruments or nearby structure, and then also the infrared load from the lunar surface. Um, and then those flux is also account for the direct and reflected solar. And so that's the way we handle that. Um, and then if something is particularly sensitive to a nearby load, an infrared load, um, then like, as Ben pointed out, you know, um, changing the location on the lander has proven to be pretty straightforward, whether that be for a thermal reason or whether that be for any other kind of reason, you know, interference with the line of sight or, um, you know, some of our um, some of our instruments don't like being near hydrogenous uh, 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 sor sources of hydrogen. And so moving the payloads around to accommodate those kind of things, that's been relatively straightforward thus far. Okay. Any, anything else for Ron? I've got one more question about the vibration environment. Uh, how, how are you dealing with that? Uh, do each clips uh, provide a, give you uh, sort of shock loads and vibration environment for payloads at different locations? So. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly how we've been handling it. Is um, once we settle on the location, um, then the uh, the lander partners they will provide us with the environment at those locations. And then those become the uh, environments that we test to. And that would include any kind of vibe loads. Uh, and it would also include any kind of thermal loads. I, I think it's safe to say some of the vendors are more mature in that modeling than others. Um, so, you know, once we get a little more experience and they go through some actual testing and have results, we might find that some of those models need to be improved. Thank you guys for the workshop. And I, I was just wondering more about a philosophical thing with it, where you think about interoperability with the interfaces. So if you have an interface, if they're interoperable amongst the different landers, or also interoperable with the different interfaces for power or any of these connections with the landers. Yeah, so this is the commercial world. To some extent, they don't necessarily want lots of interoperability. <laughs> Uh, some things are pretty clean. RS-422, I think all the vendors we've looked at so far are using RS-422. Is that right, Ryan? Yeah, that's that's true. And another one is is power. Uh, some some vendors are willing to accommodate different kind of powers, but the overwhelming majority of them um, would yeah, prefer a 28-volt DC, for example. Yeah. Um, over time, I would expect that to solidify because of both, you know, both we and them want to reduce the cost of being able to put payloads out there. But any place where the vendor feels like there's a competitive advantage associated with their way of doing business, mm -hmm. they may not change it rapidly. <laughs> uh, yeah, lightning plug versus a micro USB. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we haven't seen a lot of that from the vendors yet. I'm not even sure they're ready to think about those kinds of discussions. Um, the, the Astrobotic is probably the one that comes the closest towards defining a standard that everybody else is intended to meet. Many of the other vendors are, tell us what your payload does and we'll go figure it out type. So I, I, there's going to be some movement amongst the vendor community as they mature. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think, let's put it this way. 
what I would recommend from a payload perspective, kind of where Ryan was going with the chart here, was since you can't know, when you're designing a, an instrument you want to get flown, and we can't tell you up front which vendor is going to fly it for you, minimizing the amount of change you have to make to enable it to get, you know, potentially manifested by multiple vendors is how we keep our costs low. Yeah. Uh, Hold on, Dennis. So, for these only, I'm Chris Colbert. I'm the project manager for Clips. Chris, prior to August 1981, we heard exactly the same thing in the computer industry. A little <laughs> company called IBM came in yeah. and c came that up with a standard. So I'm a, an extreme advocate of standards uh, in the business, and it's really the only path to future success. Has anyone thought about adopting something like the DARPA pods interface or you know, something like that to bring a little order to the chaos? To, to some extent, you know, NASA can push that, right? If we just if we start telling everybody out there, this is the interface you have to meet for our standards. Um, well, we did the same thing with CubeSats. Yeah, I right. Mean, there was chaos, much chaos, until the CubeSat standard came in, which is not the best interface for anybody, right. but it is an interface that is now rules yeah. that part but, of the world. But a little bit of background why we haven't inflicted standards already is we had... Um, we had a workshop down at LPI, it's probably a year, 18 months ago, well, you, you know, probably about a year ago now, where we raised this, we had several of the people who ended up becoming Clips providers there, it was open to anybody, and we had this discussion on standards, and the feedback we got from all the commercials was essentially, if you, if you pick a standard now, if we happen to be one of the companies who doesn't use that, that will have a massive negative effect on us. So we, they were uh, so we were basically asked, please don't standardize until we've at least had a chance to get started, or you will kill some of us off before it even begins. Yeah, I worked for a company called Vector Graphic Inc. that said the same thing before August of 81. It, standardization, if we don't standardize, NASA's cost is going up, everybody's cost is going up. It, this is something we've got to get a handle on, and unfortunately, our friends in the government are the ones that are going to have to drive this boat. So this is Steve Clark. You bring up a good point, and we have been talking about that. We have to find the right balance to jumpstart this industry. This is new. Landing on the moon's hard. We've seen it. I mean, this isn't a terrestrial system. This is something that we've got to help the commercial providers get started and then we can certainly have discussions on what works best for the commercial industry but this is as has been mentioned this is a commercial service where NASA is one of many customers and if we drive a standard that's great for us but then it impacts the other customer bases for these commercial providers we have to find a good balance and so I'm not saying we won't address it. It's just this is a uh, complex question, and we're, we haven't even flown the first mission yet, so we've got to help them get started first and then start looking at what makes sense across the board. But you do bring up a good point. We just have to do it the right way. Okay. I, I, I just have to say it one more time because I've been involved in this for <laughs> 35 years, is the IBM PC was a crappy standard. It was a terrible system for most people, but it was a standard that brought everyone's costs down, especially the users, which are the people that pay the bills. And the users are the commercial world as well as the government world. And we changed the world when we did that in 1981. And if we do it early now, it can only help the industry. And, and as you and I had this discussion a decade ago, if I remember right. <laughs> We've been having it for 30 years. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it, it, your point's taken. We needed to get through at least a little bit of these interfaces to start finding out where it made sense to start setting standards. Yeah, I was just going to, you've said a lot of what I was going to say is what's interesting in my experience so far uh, being one of the clips in, instruments and one of the more com complex ones, we've got basically three instruments wrapped into one, is uh, a lot of the instruments there now are built um, in the traditional NASA way in that most missions are very optimized. And that does not usually lead to standardization. And so that it will be very interesting. This is going to be a huge learning experience for all of us to understand uh, where that threshold is for both the providers 
and the NASA instrument leads and, and non-NASA instrument providers to NASA is to exactly where is that standardization, where is the simplification, even if it's a non-optimal approach for a discovery class mission, which doesn't care about standardization, it cares about that half kilogram. I can't have that, you know. Um, so it, it, I can almost imagine there being two populations of instrument, I mean this is a whole new thing, two different populations of instrument types, one that really is geared towards a commercial landed surface, um, much like the computer that were being discussed, those were the first time they were being geared towards a commercial service as opposed to a very dedicated, uh, optimized scenario. Hi, so I'm just uh, curious about your radiation modeling techniques. When you're looking at a situation where you'll have several payloads within close proximity to each other and each payload may not know the composition of the payload next to it, that kind of thing? Yeah, Ryan, why don't you talk about some more about that, because Ryan's right. What we did was we, we picked up a model that Space Station had used, which used kind of these flux cube discussions. As it isn't perfect, but it appears to work reasonably well on Space Station. Ryan, you want to talk more about that? Are you talking about thermal radiation? Uh, no, uh, oh. ionizing radiation. Sorry, I was, I was assuming thermal. Uh, no, so I'm thinking ionizing radiation, particles passing through one payload that may be uh -huh. a heavy composition, which may then hit a lighter, a payload with a lighter composition, that type of thing. And trying to figure out which direction is potential. Uh, yeah, yeah you're, really, you're talking about the exposure discussion and, and what that happens when payloads are all mixed together in environments. Ryan, have we even had any discussions on that yet? No, we haven't really, um, but, but, um, the, 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 the lander partners, they, they do have integrated models. Um, and today, <clears throat> today they, they have been asking us for uh, CAD models of our hardware that have the, you know, appropriate, um, you know, CG, MOI, moment of inertia, et cetera. Um, we haven't really gotten into any integrated radiation modeling or the need to do uh, such modeling, but, um, I know that that's one of the things that on the payload providing side we have talked about because one of the payloads that we're flying is a radiation monitor and they have talked about the need to be able to um, model that environment. I think getting, getting the properties that would be necessary to run an integrated model, I, I think in many instances that would be something that we could pull off from getting data from the lander providers, um, but we, we really haven't gotten into that detailed modeling yet. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on what Tony was saying, um, which is there's a, there's a third class, and you alluded to this totally, which is are the instruments standalone? Does the mission fully integrate them? Or do we, NASA, some third party, provide some of those commonalities? And um, is there room for these three instruments are all sitting on one deck. Here's a common thermal solution. Here's a common... Um, data storage solution for those three instruments. And um, I hear you that, you know, the science community has to move more towards this model for it to really work in partnership, um, but I feel like there's also really good science that we're going to miss by trying to have everyone bring their own thermal and everyone bring their own power and data storage and, and whatever else we all have to bring. Um, so I think there's, there's room for these mission provided or mission common elements um, that maybe NASA can think about um, as well. So that would be more a case of NASA deciding to, that it would almost fly as a CLIPS instrument, a solid state data recorder that the other, in, it would provide that. Like I've touched upon and we're going to do in the discussion, mobility, accessing the, accessing the surface. Exactly. You're saying that we should be thinking about perhaps core capability, allowing... A radiator, a solid state data recorder, something that our instruments can hook into. Because um, you're, you're causing a lot of duplication by having everyone try to provide their own and pushing that down to individual providers, and that increases the cost ultimately. So in that scenario, we're almost designing a mini spacecraft that happens to be landed on a CLIPS lander. Well, <laughs> no, no, I'm not being that. That. But we have yeah. these things called 6U spacecraft that are going to yeah. be, pro yeah, that cool, are going to okay. be, yeah, I mean, we have these CubeSats that are going to be going. So they have, you know, power and calm and thermal all in these little tiny packages. Um, and so you don't put them in orbit, you mount them to the top of the deck. 
Right. I, Common yeah. missions. Yeah, yeah sorry. Thank you. But for task order two, that didn't work very well because we were just throwing a grab bag of random instruments out there, right? So when we start going that towards we love the PI equally led, everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we go towards right. the PI led approach, you might identify a common service that all four payloads that you're flying together makes sense to do. And then it becomes a discussion about whether we're we're building it for the payloads or whether we require the vendor to give it to us as part of the response. But also we or, need to but, but if but if or we're if gonna, it's GFE. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's but, what I meant by we would provide it, right? Oh, no, well, the instruments can provide it. Yeah. I think there's three. And I think this is where maybe we do this could be a subject on a, a longer when we've got longer to talk, is for us to get an understanding, you know, what instrument, how beneficial is this, and, and do we really need to be thinking about it now or we're going to lose out, uh, right, right from the very sure. beginning? Yeah, that's the optimization I've talked about. As I was trying to mention, is that's how you really get this, this discovery class or better science is by optimizing the technologies with the measurements. And, and we're trying to do that now like because it's a grab bag. Each instrument is not at all optimized. We're all kind of morphing into whatever we can do to interface to this. Um, and it's duplicative. It's, 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 not, it's not optimized. So that can either be as part of your PI suite, you say yeah. this suite would have this thermal system, exactly. this own solid state data recorder, or it's, it's if particularly when we're looking at perhaps mixing a PI suite with other instruments that we have ready to fly, realizing that there's a benefit by adding some central services capability. Yeah. So if it's okay to jump in, at least from a provider perspective. Um, I, um, so we're Astrobotic, just a reminder. Um, so we're one of the CLIPS teams. There's, there's a bunch of others out there. Um, but from a uh, you know, uh, additional services kind of approach, we are thinking about that and listening to the community. So things that we've thought about are common storage, uh, off-payload uh, off processing, for example. I mean, you could almost think of it like, a, like an Amazon Web Services on board the lander. Um, to support the payloads, but we need to learn more from the community what the needs are and what the common uh, interfaces could be. Um, and just generally with interfaces, we're always trying to try, try to have them very, very simple so that the interactions between the customer and the provider are, are simple. Um, because if you get really complicated, I mean, we, we've explored the idea of, hey, maybe we should control the thermal or, or control the payloads thermally ourselves. Uh, but then we would need to intimately understand every little detail of the payload, um, and it gets to be very, very complex uh, interface. So we're trying to find like the sweet spot um, where it's simple enough that the that we can sell many, many different payloads and have many uh, integrated onto one lander that doesn't uh, kill us from a complexity standpoint. Um, so we're listening, we're we're open, um, and we do want to add those capabilities, those core common capabilities. So just just from our perspective, um, you know, let us know what you need. Um, and we're going to be looking for those commonalities to build that capability over time. Thank you. And so, Bob, would a central computing capability be another example? Right. Okay. So, so my only, sorry, my only point being that when you move to this PI model, that's something for you to consider. I'm not saying you have to do it on the first one. I agree with you. There may be some things where three disparate instruments could you know make complementary measurements on their own and you don't really need a lot of integration between them but i agree tony there's the cato level science is needs to be more integrated than that and work more hand in hand and well, and so when you put out that call it's something to think about whether you, we can i don't think as pi's it's reasonable to ask us to propose back something and then tell you what we need and then you're going to decide later <laughs> that you're going to provide some parts of yeah. it. It's not a really fair competition is all I'm saying. So decide that early and let us just know the parameters. So are you saying that you think the PI-led suite should propose the, so as part of their proposal should include these three instruments are going to have the, this common thermal, common power, common computer, are you saying you, you, the proposal would say, here are my instruments, we're going to need you to provide this? I'm just trying to, because that, that, that comes into where we've thrown out, are those numbers, money and mass, are they, do they pass the giggle factor? And that's going to be a factor of whether you're just proposing three instruments or you're proposing three instruments and a joint thermal system and a solid state data recorder, et cetera. I mean, I guess I, I think maybe for your first round, I guess I don't see a problem with just saying, propose three things that are already in LSIP-P or NPLP and that can do complementary measurements and I bet you can, I know, I know you can get some good things 
initially out of that. But we're trying to. I, I, but then I put, but I'm, I'm trying to do better. We're trying to do better than that initially. We're, what we're trying to talk about here. Sorry if I've misspoke. That isn't what we're trying to get from. We're trying to jump straight through. You propose two or three instruments that you build as part of your proposal. If you can leverage as extra LCP or whatever, that's great. But what I'm trying to do as part of the discussion period now is thinking more along the lines of, no, what do we need to help you do so that you're proposing two okay. or three new instruments to do focus science? I think it would be beneficial to every instrument suite and every PI-led proposal for NASA to articulate what it will provide as GFE, okay. including examples like common solid state data recorders, a common radiator that we could hook into, et cetera. Okay, and then we just factor that into the, over yeah, okay. And I wanted to follow up on that. That's the balloon model, the Columbia Scientific Balloon uh, Facility model. They provide batteries and solar and CNDH and COM. So when you're building your instrument for a balloon, all you have to do is focus on making the best instrument to do your science. But there's GFE that's part of the package. Okay. So there okay. is a model out there. Okay, brilliant. Sorry, you've been very patient. Yeah, uh, the 30 million for a suite, that's, that's thin compared to discovery. So are you willing to tolerate a lot more risk? <laughs> class D. I don't know if that gives you, <coughs> class D minus? Are we going back to college now? <laughs> no. where, where, where did you end up? No, but this is, this is why we throw out the numbers. I mean, it's a compromise between having enough, you know, have, trying to do two of these a year and wanting to make sure what we don't want to do is put a number that's too low and we don't get good, we don't get good suites. And, and, and that's, that's the real trade, right? How much we invest in the instruments so that we can fly frequently versus how much we fly, you know, every once in a while with bigger instruments. Yeah, so Paul, your director, the, yes, we want to look at more cost-effective ways of doing um, discovery class science. If, if the PI is willing to take a little bit more risk because, quite frankly, this model is risky with the new commercial providers, right, until we get some runtime. Um, and we've got nine on the contract now, right? Um, there will be a slow buildup of what I'd call heritage flights, right, as they get more under their belt. So there is going to be inherent risk anyway getting to the surface. So then I would say as PIs, you would need to look at, I've got to take that into consideration. I'm not going to um, propose and build the most exquisite science instrument, right? I, I can take a little bit more risk and go more towards a class D um, instrument. Well, it, it doesn't levy as much requirements on you, right? So can you come to come to my, because okay. if you're saying you want to do discovery class, well, that 30 million is, you know, a pretty modest, unique camera one is three million okay with margin and everything so if you want to do a suite you're going to have to push the class down so that you know and that's not my risk that's just i'm just meeting the requirements but if it's discovery program level of quality then that's thin okay yeah. point well taken go ahead uh, addy dove university of central florida um so in addition to the cost numbers on here, there's nothing about TRL, right? And so if the idea is to have these calls every year or something like that, and you're expecting, so the last uh, selection, right, was all flight-ready instruments. They were all spares and things like that. If you're planning on having calls every year, you're going to run out of those, and there's going to have to be more instrument development that would come maybe from Dolly or something like that. Well, so, the, so, yeah, we are still doing Dali. We will still have calls for instruments to help them get ready to fly. Mm -hmm. But also, to hit to the discussion points, that's where I've put up here, and from the look at the immediate reaction, is the answer <laughs> is no. Yeah. Is, yeah, is, 20, is 22 months enough time to develop something from a certain TRL level that you, or is it woefully I, inadequate? I mean, it depends on what TRL level, level you're going to start accepting for these calls, right? 22 months is not enough if you have like a TRL 4-ish payload maybe, depending on the complication, uh, like the complexity of the instrument, right? Some of them might be super easy to develop up to that level and especially if there's high risk involved. So if you're talking about like CubeSat level instruments, you can do it in that timeline. 
for maybe this cost cap, definitely this cost cap, right? But if you're talking, because that's way more than you get for a lot of CubeSat stuff. Um, but if you're talking about <coughs> discovery class instruments, it's a, I don't know that game as much. Uh, I, I know CubeSat side and like suborbital side a little bit more, right? Um, and so you sort of have to say what sort of TRL you're okay with, what level of risk you're okay with, what level of like testing of the instruments prior to flight you're okay with, um, especially for the 22 months time frame. Okay. And I would say back to the sort of integration thing, there's a lot of work being done right now for suborbital payload providers uh, where there are calls to do sort of um, from, from NASA, there are calls in STMD to do integrated payload development in terms of common interfaces and things like that um, that can be used for lots of different payloads. So that's like a place you can sort of look for some examples of how those calls work, for instance. Um, and there's a lot of work in CubeSats and suborbital right now in sort of making standardized payload interfaces that uh, providers might look at as well. Thanks. I have uh, two questions. One, I think the 22 months is good for, I mean, we have a flight spare, so 22 months would be adequate. But if it was TRL-3, it would not be adequate. Okay, but my actual question is, what does GFP or GFE stand for that Barbara mentioned on her, on your commentary? Go government oh. Furnished Equipment. Thank you very much. Just a quick comment on the class. I think people get a little mixed up on what it means to be class D versus risk and discovery level science doesn't mean it has to be class B, which is what the class of discovery is now. The first several discovery missions were class D missions. And you know, Lunar Prospector was about $80 million total. Uh, Lunar Pathfinder was a class D mission. Uh, so don't think that class D and class B and the dollars that you save between them, you can save two to three times factor in programmatic dollars. It's a great aerospace study done recently on this uh, as uh, anything to do with the quality of the science. It has to do with tailoring of the NASA requirements into a more risk tolerant, not necessarily more risky, but more risk tolerant position. So I think it's great you maintain this as class D. You can get two, three payloads done in that time in my, in my experience. I wanted to say, first of all, thank you very much, Steve and Ben, for coming out. Uh, this, is, this is just a fantastic opportunity for our community, and, and this dialogue has been great. And the point that I wanted to make is, um, what um, outreach have you done to the space biology community separately, um, if, if any, and then to let you know that there is a conference coming up, their annual conference, the ASGSR, meeting is, uh, I believe, the week before Thanksgiving, um, I think Denver this year, so uh, might be a good thing to uh, send your newbie to, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Brad. Hang on, wh where, where is it? I think this is called it's Payback. In, it, it's in Denver. I'm yeah. not sending him anywhere nice. <laughs> uh, it's in North Dakota. In, uh, <laughs> So to answer your question, Greg, yes, we've actually been talking with the Slipshro folks. Okay. Um, they're interested in looking for some opportunities to fly um, payloads on slips. <coughs> so we've, we've had initial discussions with them. And so those are going to continue to look for opportunities, such as maybe in, in another in a call, we may put language in there to include them as well, you know, because we've said they were the first time. Well, they didn't know enough to, to really propose, I don't think. Right. So, but yeah, they were thinking technology and, right, science. They, anyway, we're, we're, we're talking with them now more. I think they kind of didn't read it through and felt like they could propose to it. Now I think they do, and they just need to understand a little bit more about how the whole process works. So, yep. This meeting that, this meeting that I mentioned is, is a fairly similar meeting to this kind of one for that uh, community. So I could imagine a similar sort of forum. Um, just just a thought. So okay. it sounds like you've already started that process. We should compare great. notes on points of contact too. Happy to do that. Okay. Um, so just before you go, so just, um, just so you, for everyone in the room, this is basically the last slide. And all I've done is gone through the presentation that I gave at the beginning and tried to pull out things that I thought would help promote discussion. 
Um, that said, any, we've actually automatically covered some of this already. We've sort of already nicely degenerated into the discussion period. But if there are other things that you've heard discussed so far, we can come back to any of that. Otherwise, after the questions, I'll just keep going through. And I do also, in case it's useful, I have that one again um, in case there are aspects of this that people want to discuss. Yeah. But otherwise, basically, these are just meant to promote discussion, but anyone wants to stand up and discuss anything that you've, that is good feedback, that's great. I've got one quick question, and it's perfect time because I wanted some clarification on what you meant by, are, are you thinking about the PI provided suites, the 30 million versus a third of the discovery cost? Would the idea being that proposals would go in to say, I need a mission to go to this location, and it needs this instrument suite, which costs about $30 million and 30 kilograms, is the idea that the NASA would buy through one of the tasks a CLIPS lander to do that mission? Yes. So, okay. I, again, so the, and, I, and I, I was worried that this was going to be, oh, um, I didn't want that to be confusing to say, discovery, don't get quantitative on me, you know, discovery yeah. for a third the cost. My point is, you can look at what we're paying to have instruments delivered right now, because, you know, Steve showed that. The idea is, yes, you would propose, as I gave the example earlier, three instruments that if you could send to one of these five lunar swirls, that we would do some really good science, approaching what you might try and do with a discovery mission. That would then get folded into a task order where we'll say, hey, fly that in that suite, and this couple of other things that are actually worth flying but are location agnostic, um, to one of these five sites, we get a cost for that, it flies. That's what I'm trying to convey by the discovery class science for third the cost. So um, back to your other slide, the mobility and um, night survival and stuff like that, of course those would add a lot of value and a lot of additional science that you can do for certain uh, things. For example, if you want to go to a lunar swirl, mobility is really important to be able to see how, you know, access of ions to the surface changes as a function of the magnetic field strength and orientation and that sort of thing. And so, I mean, you can get a lot of really good science when, if that stuff is contributed, but if that has to be part of that 30 million no. having, then that um, is really uh, hard to do with that. So let me describe what we were meaning here by saying mobility. So Steve mentioned we have sort of the Viper rover, very large rover, and we've talked about rovers of that scale going forward. What we're talking about here is how advantageous, how, how much would the science either improve or needs to have, let's say, a rover that can go 100 meters. And then if there's enough interest in that, then when we can consider an RFP for a rover of that scale. And about like five kilometers. Okay, well, this is why we, yeah, no, so that, no, that's, that's the question. What is the distance that makes it worth having, you know, 10 meters isn't worth having over a static lander. Is, a, is it 100 meters? Is it a kilometer? Is it five kilometer? That's why w that's the discussion to have, because then potentially we offer rovers of a different scale and then and they can be provided by commercial and then we provide that and it becomes part of flying as part of the task order that's the sort of scenario we're discussing do you want mobility the same thing potentially with accessing lunar material either surface or subsurface rather than ask you each time you want to do this to propose the, the, the ability to do that as part of your suite we think there might be logic in having a range of capabilities for accessing lunar material that you call upon saying, this suite needs this capability, and it's up to, and then that becomes GFE as well, essentially. Yeah, GFE, or if we know it, we can advertise it to the vendors. And uh, Mobility, for example, you all heard yeah. from John today, you know, many of the vendors, not just Trash Robotic, are prepared to provide smaller scale rovers sooner rather than later. Night survival, I think it's way off. I, Vendors aren't ready for that yet, but, but mobility, we could potentially get mobilities from the vendors pretty quickly. And we could certainly GFE small rovers ourselves if we want. So to come back to the distance, I'm trying to think what is the best way to reach out to the community to find out what that sort of number is? Is it, an, is it, a, is it worth doing a full day workshop basically like this, but with enough, but with heads up of what's gonna get discussed and input on what we should discuss? Or is it just, is it just, advertising, please email, I mean, 
There is no, op there's no obvious answer. Well, if it's not going to survive the night, then that's going to put a pretty hard limit on the distance that you can go, right? Okay. I mean, so, um, but yeah, I think I did not attend the landed science workshop, but I think there probably was some discussion there on the sorts of distances you want to be able to do. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the community can provide that information. Like, I mean, the swirls are a really good example where being able to traverse across uh, different kinds of magnetic fields where we see the bright and the, the dark lanes and then bright regions, you know, those are kilometer scale traverses. But the uh, moment you so get out of line of sight, of sorry, but we've got to think about if you're, if you're always going to be talking traverse distances which likely take you out of line of sight of the lander, then we but have we've to... we've got come on our uh, Polaris rover. <laughs> Or we have to, or, or com relay becomes more important. Right. Yeah, so ju just to speak to the distances, th th there is a, um, uh, a step function. So if you're close to the, to the lander and in sight, um, it's about 500 meters, maybe 750 meters. And we can look at some other comm protocols that might work with the attenuation on the surface. But it's on order of that for a rover that will communicate to the lander and then back to Earth. And then there's a step function in cost and scale once you go outside of that reach. Because essentially the rover has to have its own direct to Earth comm. Mm -hmm. Or potentially if there's a relay satellite, then, then that, that's another step function in the opposite direction. Um, but, but basically if you're communicating all the way back home to Earth, it's a huge amount of power uh, draw. So just in thinking about that, there is that step function in line of sight. Um, inside a line of sight, you could do it for a handful of kilograms um, to go you can go in circles or back and forth or whatever, but as long as you're in, in line of sight. So that's, that's just a way to think about it. Um, so you mentioned night survival kind of in the sense of science that requires more than one day to accomplish, but I think the thing that's missing there is also night operations. You know, yep. There's a significant number of science that would like to take data continuously, or there might be unique data sets that can only be collected at night and probably not gonna happen on these rovers anytime soon, but this does seem like an area where if there was government furnished equipment, you know, you know, suite type uh, capability to allow night operations or night survival, at least for that aspect of the, of the payload. Uh, what about also having a robotic arm? That would be really nice. I would argue that that's part of when I was talking about having the ability to either do surface or subsurface access to bring material up to your instrument for whatever mechanism. An arm is one way of doing that, an, ar an arm, a drill, or just touching the surface. Or a scoop if you just need some surface regolith. I'm sure Chris is going to follow me quickly, but uh, there are companies out there that are willing to offer that either as a service separately from the landers or through the landers. Maxar being one of them, we're flying one of the early uh, LSITP uh, payloads, but it's definitely something if you have a specific need uh, where you know, you're pulling for that capability, we'd love to hear about that so we can build our capabilities around it. Yeah, you know, there's an, uh, there's an interesting trade point here. Philosophically, from a CLIPS perspective, we want to get as much as we possibly can from the vendor. Um, arm striking is something that's relatively mature. We've got a fair amount of experience flying arms in a variety of locations. I'd love to see vendors provide us arms. You know, let John go cut a deal with, with Chris or whoever he wants to to provide us that. We just define the requirements so that they do it. Um, the, the mobility already looks like something that we can get a lot of, particularly on a smaller scale, a lot of help on. Um, Com relay, not as clear we can get help on that right now, unless we go cut bigger deals elsewhere, right? Um, it'd be interesting to have a discussion about where those, where those natural breakpoints are. But from a philosophical standpoint, I want to get as much from the vendors as I possibly can because competition across the vendors lowers the cost for all of us. Uh, just some food for thought based on a lot of the feedback that I'm hearing is you might want to think about suite of missions where you can, instead of just random mixing and matching, where you can have providers, for example, if there's a requirement for surviving the night, you can have payloads that actually have those kind of requirements. If it's proximity type of sensors, so having a more of a long-term architecture that you can, you can match payloads that can actually, suite of payloads that can actually match with the lander capabilities, that's, that's one way of doing it. Uh, second question is for NASA internal calls, are you, is there an allocation for certain mission directorates? SMD will get out of the 12 or 13 X numbers and then SLIPS was mentioned, SLIPS or, or life sciences could get a certain number of payloads. 
and certain you know, slots for technology demonstration missions. The idea now is that there wouldn't be another NASA internal call. The call would be to both internal and external. They would be reviewed, and the best ones float to the top. And those best ones based on SMD, decadal, or again, if there's uh, PIs from other mission directorates, or tech demo type of payloads. Well, similar to the way we ran NPLP and LCP, we had reps from those mission directorates on the review panels, right? And so if we're going to keep it broad, like technology development, science, we're going to have the expertise on those to evaluate those specific proposals. And then, you know, depending on what the panels find out, then there'll be a recommendation up to the selecting official of, you know, these technology development payloads, we recommend these science ones. We just have to see how that falls out. But we had reps, and we will continue to have reps from the other mission directorates so that we can look at those, the broad um, broad swath of what we're asking for. Okay. Now, you. there may be some specific, like Ben's been talking about here, those PI-specific ones will be science, right? They w there won't be technology development. It won't be a broad call. It would be a PI-specific type of suite going to a specific location. You know, that's more of a traditional science review. Thank you. So at the risk of Jake hitting me or, or Steve, when, when Ben talks about a cadence of a couple missions a year, that's out of Steve's budget. Contractually, though, there's no reason UMD couldn't throw their own money into the pool and fly a third mission. Or STMD could throw money in the pool and fly a mission. You know, right now, the two missions per year is based on the budget Steve's got available. Yeah, and I think, uh, Darren, I mentioned in my, uh, my talk earlier was that we're looking at having the CLIPS providers be an asset to NASA as one of many customers and not just science. So perfect example, like you said, if, say, STMD wants to fly just a, a payload that's going to take up the full capacity of what we can get, then we would look to STMD to provide us the money, right, uh, do pool the, the money together to be able to fly something like that, right? Uh, so since this, since this combined call was mentioned, moving forward, is it going to be an open, you know, best science instrument wins type of call, or are you going to look at what's been selected to date, what you already have funded and is ready to fly, and try to fill in the holes so you have a more broad suite of instruments? So it, that, are you talking about, so you're not talking about PI-led suites now, you're talking about people proposing single instruments? Yes. Well, because I am... When we put up here NPLP rebuild, we were conscious of the fact that we didn't want to stop someone else proposing an instrument of a similar type that happened to not get selected. Mm -hmm. So it was a compromise between, if you like, potential cost savings versus not wanting to exclude. So I don't know if we have an answer. For, I mean, at some level, we have to try and spend the money wisely. And if we've already got two magnetometers, probably best not to propose a third one to the first two have flown to be, you know, probably. Now, that said, if, but if it's part of a PI suite and you want your magnetometer because it's, it's combined with the others and you're doing combined science, I think that's different. But right now, all the NPLP ones have essentially flown. It, obviously, we are tasked with trying to fly the LCIP P ones, you know, as soon as possible. So I would imagine it's feasible that there'll be some mixture going forward, but like I said, we want to try and head towards either PI suite or PI single instruments. Um, you know, the, the NPLP and LCP were an unusual way to help us get started quickly. Okay. That we, Once they are gone and flown, it really is going to be all PI led. Um, is there a list of these instruments somewhere that were selected? Yes, there's a web page where you can look at what was selected. Right, on both programs? Yes. So this, is, this may be sort of a, not a high order question, but back on thoughts and concerns on interfaces, there, there's a lot of plasma and radio instruments, plasma wave instruments that, have, that are, have been selected. And one of those, what they need are actually good grounding to the plasma. And, uh, and so is there any, uh, conductivity requirements on the outer skin of the spacecraft. I know you have uh, requirements for EMI, but have you thought about grounding, grounding to the plasma and, you know, having conductive surface requirements? 
particularly if you're selecting plasma type or yeah. RF type instruments? Good, good question. I, it, I don't think it's come up with any of the instruments we've dealt with yet. Um, John, we might ask you, does that pose any problems from your perspective? Yeah. Because you're grounded I, to the plasma. The ground is a terrible I, ground. Right. I mean, I, you I can't get you. an electron yeah. out of that ground, but you're grounded to the plasma. Just like scientific spacecraft that yep. fly in heliophysics. You know, they they actually have really strict grounding require conductivity requirements on yeah. that outer skin. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've seen some of that before. I, I don't think it's come up with any of the instruments we've dealt with so far. That, that's a good question. We'll probably have to have some discussion about that. I don't think we've dealt with it yet. Yeah, well, think about it because yeah. it's, it's important. Yep, yep thanks. So if there is, if there are no other questions, which there, one more. Okay. Um, following up what Heather just asked for, um, you said there's a website that has that lists the things that have been selected. Could you put up that web address somewhere so we? Well, can you, um, I don't have it on here. You can search for it. I mean, I search for it very easily. What's the search term? <laughs> um, so you, you you can search for NPLP and LSIT P selection. And it should, or go to the Moon to Mars um, webpage within NASA, and that, and the, you'll see announcements for both selections. So before everyone escapes, or if ever, okay, but yeah. It hasn't been brought up, but just because I'm just trying to understand this new paradigm, because when you propose, you don't know which lander you're going to be matched with. Right. And also, the number of types of landers are going to change. Some are going to join the fray, and some might go away. Um, and you're going to be, it's most likely you're going to see a recommended general suite of things to match to. At what point so will you, what, you know, the... Oh, interfaces, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you had this 15 kilograms. Yeah. So interfaces, if you choose, you decrease your chances of issues, right. yeah. So at what point do you find out where you've been matched? Are you at... So you would, you would be, let's say you, you won the you know, PI suite, and theoretically, depending on finances and the scale of what's proposed, <laughs> there could be more than one PI suite on a particular task order. So there would be a task order, and the task order would say, we would like you to fly these instruments to one of these locations. We have the review. When we would make the announcement, um, so that's a good point. So what, what we've written here is there would probably be about three months, normally three months, from you being selected and therefore hopefully starting to build before you actually knew which lander um, you were flying on. And that fact, this is a really good point because if, you, if there's what, there'd be things that you can't do until you know which lander, but hopefully there is enough work that you can do just because you've been selected and can start to do um, order long duration lead parts so that, because if you have got 22 months, and that might be an issue, you can't afford to lose three of them doing, you know, not, because you can't do anything because we haven't told you which lander. But normally, we're thinking it's probably roughly a month, because we'll have the task order prime ready to go, except for that portion of the payload that we're asking to be flown, and then typically probably a couple of months for, to get the proposals in, and then the, the lander provided to be selected. Okay, and so then once you've been mated, uh, match made, uh, do you, does the PI, do you get a chance to interact with the yeah. lander and work out the interface issues? So you not only get a chance, it's required. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. okay. <laughs> and there's not going to be a risk that the lander will go away and you can be a match with someone else later on or anything. You, you just, okay. That's a little tougher to answer. Uh, yeah, uh, right. I, I wouldn't say, yeah, Steve said it right. It's, it was, you know, this is a new, new field with new vendors. Um, None of them who've ever flown to the moon yet. So I think there certainly is some risk that we'll start down a process and a vendor, for whatever reason, determines they can't complete the mission. That, that's certainly some risk of that. Um, we'll know more after we get through some more here, I think. But, uh, and let me go back. Your previous question, if you, the, yeah. the, there is Eclipse public website. Um, if you search for NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services, it'll take you to Eclipse public website, and both lists of the NPLP and the LSIT payloads are on that website. And then another question, say that the uh, rocket blows up on the launch pad and you lose your payload, um, would you then get another chance to fly or would that be it? Or is that not to be worried about now because that likely won't happen? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I like that thought, but <laughs> um, you will have to cross that bridge when we get to it. 
we are not, we have told the vendors they are not liable for losing our payloads. That's traditional with a NASA payload. They're, you know, if they lose it in flight or they blow it up on the launch pad, they don't have to pay us back for the payload. I mean, um, whether or not we fly again would depend on a variety of things that Steve and his, his office yeah. have to work through. I mean, that isn't typical. You look at discovery, that doesn't happen. Pardon? Yeah. Um, so, unless there are, any, are there any other questions, the only last thing I'd like to use the collective wisdom here is, what would you like to do next regarding to interacting with us? Hopefully this has been some use, even if it's just got you thinking. So, you, could, you can find our emails, just reach out, and it, we, it would be good to get the feedback to say, we don't want to organize a one-day workshop on this if that isn't really what you want and no one wants to come. So the purpose of this is how can we get you the information that you need that helps you in, so that we write the right kind of AO so that we get good proposals? I mean, I think one piece of information that would be good is when this starts. When does this start? When do we start this? When, when does the draft AO come out? <laughs> I feel like <laughs> so, um, so if, 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 you know, without, that with spit multiple factors, but certainly it's feasible that we would have a draft AO out perhaps late this calendar year, early next calendar year, to, with review to a call sometime next year. That's what we're hoping to do. Awesome. <laughs> and actually follow on from that. From, your, from the perspective of how arduous it either is or isn't writing proposals, theoretically, as, as you saw when we did one task order and picked three um, providers, we have flexibility. And you know, Would you rather see as a community one of these every six months, or would you rather it was one a year and we pick two? Or do you not care? Yeah, so yeah, if we did two deliveries from a, you know, we could from select two password, PI yeah. suites from a single proposal to fly, you know. We've said we want, you know, we have the flexibility in how many we pick per task order. I'm highly biased, so I like the once a year because that means my team only has to exercise the process once a year. But, but, but the truth is we will do whatever makes sense for the community. Um, uh, we gave them 60 pages, I believe. But he's been for the sun. Oh, for the instruments. Ah, oh. Yeah, that's up to, that's up to Ben and Brad. <laughs> How much do you need? <laughs> A photo. <laughs> ben, I, I was just going to suggest if you uh, need to facilitate community interaction to lower the energy barrier, we, Survey, would be very happy to uh, help out with uh, virtual workshops. So that, oh, that's that true. We could do this. We, we could do this virtually. That's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, we're happy to do that. Yeah. Um, if there happen to be two calls, would the selection from the first call be made before we had to propose to the second call? Because otherwise, you're gonna have the same amount of proposals. Yes. Yes, it would. Okay. And otherwise, I think you'd have the same amount of proposals minus the one that was selected. So. Okay. And if we, are, I mean, if we want, if this, to think it about it out loud, normally a mistake. If this was a cadence of once a year, it's not like you're wait, It's not like New Frontiers where you're wait, You know, the, you're not waiting that long to do another one. Or if there's a new science discovery that you want to react to, then you know you've got another chance to propose within a year. So uh, we haven't talked about this. So that you're, you're watching us work live here. It strikes me that we, we could run the AO process once per year. That, that doesn't have to generate just one task order. We could use that and generate two task orders off the one AO process. Yes. That's yeah. yeah. Right. But you wouldn't want us to pick six PI suites and say, we'll fund these over time and they'll fly over the next three years. That's the other yeah, shaking of, yeah, just check in. <laughs> you know, that one I liked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want you to note on your schedule, instrument AO and proposals due, that's nine, and suite selection is nine months, while the hardware for the, for the payloads is 18, 20 months. So you're, you're you know, the paper is, delivering the paper is, uh, you know, we, a lot of time. We want to get that down. We, yeah. we, we, are, we are aware that's the very valid point. And 
you know, we will take the feedback. If, if, extend, if expanding this from 22 months, because we only have to expand it once, and then you just, we just start to do the call earlier going forward if this is once per year. So if going from 22 to 26 or 30, you know, this is partly why we're trying to have this discussion to make sure that we, we'd like it to be as short as possible, but we want, it's more important we get the number right, particularly as we want new instruments to be proposed. So, so, wait, so let, let me test what I thought I heard, Ben, with the community here. 22 months is reasonable if you're starting from a base of TRL 5 or 6 or 7, right? From the then time you get the money. It, within tw yeah, yeah, yeah. From the time you get the money. If, if you're, you know, something needs to be maturing potential instruments from TRLs 2s and 3s and 4s up to TRLs 6s and 7s, whether it's a, yeah, Dolly's a piece of that, right? Is that the only piece? Yeah. So, so just, just a numbers thing to help you all, because this is actually pretty cool. A year from now, if Steve's cadence holds, we should have five missions committed to the moon in a range, somewhere in the range of 25 to 30 payloads. Hmm. So the pipeline has to get, it's not a small pipeline. <laughs> um, when you're talking about um, phasing the timelines, I feel like from my perspective, if we knew there was gonna be um, an announcement each year, the way we plan for roses, I realize this isn't roses, but that's the kinds of timelines that we plan for. So if we knew there was gonna be a call once a year in February or whatever it is, um, and then you worked it on the other end to say, oh, okay, well, you, yeah, you need actually 24 months and we're gonna, or you know, we didn't get that task order done or they couldn't deliver or whatever, like you can work that, but I would prefer not to have that bleed over into the next proposal cycle. Because you saying, well, we needed six extra months so we're gonna delay the whole call for six months means that we can't plan with our workforce and engineering support and whatever else. Well, there is, there is another scenario, which is let's say from a PI suite proposal, we do it once a year and we pick two. But those two feed into two different task orders and those right. task orders are six months apart. Then we could pick two suites, one with perhaps a 22 month construction time and one with a 28 month construction time. I Possibly, I'm just. I agree with that, but then if you encounter further uncertainty in those two selections, personally, I'd prefer you didn't delay the next round of competition. No, uh, no, I understand. Right? So yeah. it, it may delay everything else, however far, but if we knew that going in, yeah, I, okay, I, I, could, I, could, I, could, I, I get your point, Barbara. I could see that working. What we'd probably have to feel within our side is that somewhere in that process, when the delays are starting to build up, something we picked, we just decided, did, you know, ran into enough problems, we're not going to fly that one. <laughs> they got picked, but we ran into problems, you know, rather, th rather than slow everything down so we can keep up, or, or rather than yeah. slow everything else, well, that oh, one needs to oh, finish. Okay, sure or, you know, or give a six months advance notice that you're not going to solicit this time, or you're going to slip it six months, or whatever, but... A wider way to Having it sort of be an indefinite, there's going to be an announcement sometime, maybe, that, that's hard for us to plan. To no, I, I, I think uh, I, it, it makes sense. If you knew every March, there's a t there's, and we're going to pick two, and one will fly 22 months later, one will fly 20 28 months later, then you can vary what you propose. And you still know there'll be another one next March. Yeah. And that, that feeds two task orders, but the task orders would be set. So I won't speak for John, but I'm going to see, get your reaction. I would think Eclipse providers would like to see a more, a, you know, a, a good cadence of calls so that you can plan business cases and so forth as well, right? So, yes, okay. Right. Throughput, everything. Yep. So, if we were to have an AO, let's say early next year, when would you, when would you like to have a virtual workshop so that you can? I mean, do you need a couple of months during the summer to sort of cogitate on this and decide what your questions are, and we start, we try and solicit feedback, perhaps with a virtual workshop, in the fall time frame. 
Yeah, that would, so we'd have, the, we'd have a virtual workshop September, October with a view to an AO going out early next year-ish. Is there actually next year? Yeah. Finally. Well, they're only two months apart, so... Okay. so. Um, you're asking this question to a very small community. Yep. Um, I would suggest that something that the survey could do is um, have a few sort of, you know, maybe a, a cadence of every couple of weeks, uh, a Zoom meeting <laughs> is what is currently being done by Astrobiology Institute, just to sort of, you know, yeah. get the word out there and then start getting a broader community input onto these kinds of questions and then have a workshop so that the idea is matured a little broad, more broadly than it can do in the, this kind of sparsely attended meeting. Yeah, survey. We could do, we could do a survey, and then we could try and make sure we hit all the different science disciplines too. It, uh, so maybe in September instead of October, in case there's a government shutdown in October. <laughs> Go on, you know you want to, I can tell. <laughs> so, um, again, so I have experience uh, now for several years flying with the suborbital flight community. Um, and I see a lot of parallels right now, right, especially when we're talking about the cadence of selections for the different flight providers and for the payloads. And so, for instance, I had a payload that we had this payload that was selected in 2013 that flew in 2018, right? And that was because we were selected and the flight providers just weren't available until 2018. But that didn't mean that FOP stopped selecting payloads, right? There was a backlog for a little while, but now it's starting to clear out now that everybody's sort of starting to fly. Um, so Blue and Virgin are starting to fly and they're clearing out those, those backlogs. So I think that that ties to what Barb was saying and that it's much better to have like a known cadence, especially for the science PIs, to propose and maybe even selecting the flight providers at the same time as they're developing and tie those up, match the, you all are then responsible for matching those up when they work, um, but not waiting to have people propose because that just gives them a little bit more time to work on their instrument, for, for instance, maybe. Um, and so it's not a bad thing to have that regular cadence and sort of have a backlog that then once we start going, you're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of science being done. Okay. So, uh, I've got another question. So uh, y you can do uh, you know, di slightly different science and di different parts of the moon with the same instrument. So if you select it once and you go to a specific location, you competitively selected once to go to a specific location. And obviously you wanna, for example, heat flow probe, right? Uh, you wanna measure heat flow uh, in the creep zone and heat flow somewhere else. Uh, do, you, do you get preference if you, if you compete again because you have already been selected? Or, or you have to compete again with everyone else? That's interesting. I mean, you can imagine something like a heat probe is also a useful instrument by itself and is a useful instrument as part of a suite. That raises an interesting question. Do you, for, do you have a call for an instrument that you, of, that you know you would like to fly multiple copies? Because then there's an economy. If you know right up front that you're buying five, that could be part of a, that, you know, maybe we need to consider an instrument call for instruments of that type that are standalone, or that it, you can justify standalone science with them, they don't have to be part of a suite, or they become LGN. A LGN is uh, another example, right? You have for Lunar Geophysical yeah. Network, for instruments, uh, it's a network, right? Uh, so you could send them half a dozen sites. Um, so how, how would you reconcile this uh, you know, problem? Good question, don't know. Um, interesting enough, I was having that conversation in the back of the room right before this about LGN. You need multiple flights, right, to accomplish the, the objectives. And we, we need to look at that. That's something that, you know, we just started thinking about now. That's, it's, a, it's a really challenging uh, scenario to look at. You know, Jack Burns talked about the, um, the array on the far side. That would require multiple launches as well to fully lay it out and then start the science maybe start before if you could, but we've got to start thinking about that uh, in our long-range planning. We 
have a, we had a, we kind of put it in the back burner recently, but we had the idea of add-on what we called add-on payload. You know, a suite of instruments like LGN or retroreflector or something relatively cheap and easy, but it makes a lot of sense to deploy a lot of them that we just had on the shelf, and we either threw them on every mission or you know when the market matures to the point where maybe Mr. Thornton back there is flying without us, but he's got a little extra room, well, he'll throw one of these extra payloads on, you know, things that we want a lot of. But there's a third example too, which is let's say heat probes. Yeah. We, we do five heat probes and they're available on, like on the menu scenario. So you're proposing a suite of instruments yeah. and you know that, well, actually, please fly a heat probe as part of this because this is the extra, to, together with my suite, because this is the extra science that you would get. Uh, another example of uh, or measurements that you would want to do at multiple locations would be like an exospheric monitoring network. But, you know, something like that, they need to all be operating at the same time. So then, you know, that's in the paradigm where you can survive for multiple lunations so you can last for the delivery of all these different instruments in one place or different places. current topic, but uh, so there was some funding available for landers prior to the selection in order to develop the technology to a reasonable state where you could make that down selection. Do you foresee similar sorts of arrangements for people developing enabling capabilities for instruments in addition to landers? So, well, okay, now he, he actually twisted there right at the end there, okay. So the lander portion was funded out of UMD, the Catalyst Program. Uh, which is continuing, but is clearly beginning to focus more on the human scale landers than this scale landers. The belief is that this, this, this level is ready for commercialization and we're going to rely upon them for DDT and E. You added the instrumentation right at the end there. And that's so, so what I mean to say is, uh, for example, you're pointing to rovers that people might develop, drills that people might have as a standard option, robot arms that people might have. Um, there are ones that have flown and that have existed, but those are on funded flight programs and typically lie more in the range of exquisite flight instruments <laughs> rather than in the range of cheap things you want to fly 50 times. Yeah. Um, so is there any thought to developing things for the cheaper, more modular uh, capabilities you might want to have on future landers? I think one of the things we've heard um, tonight is we need to take a 10,000 foot view of, of potential things that could be enabling if they're GFE. So I think that's a great message for us to have received and to start to think about making a list of, of stuff that might fall under that category. Thanks. Well, thank you, everybody, um, for, for staying late. Um, but hopefully, Ryan, are you still on? Really, thank you for you, because you're really late. Yeah, that is He's snoring <laughs> quietly. It's all right. <laughs> Okay, so you, um, you, know, you know who we are, you know where we live. Um, con contact us if you want to. We'll probably try and sort out a survey for some of these things that we said, um, but anything that you think of, any other questions that you have, don't be shy, I know you won't. <laughs>